let's go ahead and let's begin and let's get into the word. Um, we are now in Genesis chapter 18, starting now. All right, we progress. We've actually put a chapter behind us. And um, in chapter 18, there's a really, really a lot of good things in relationship to uh, the 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 heart of the Lord, the life of the Lord, the, uh, 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 the the way the Lord sees things. We want to get in here and we want to we want to enjoy this. So I'm going to just start with a reading uh, chapter 18, one through well, maybe I'll go to 12. We'll see how far that goes. <clears throat> and the Lord appeared unto him, meaning Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door. And he bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I uh, have found favor in thy sight, <clears throat> Pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, <clears throat> for therefore are you come to show your servant, um, for, for therefore are you come to, sh come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd, and he fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and he set it before them. <clears throat> and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? <clears throat> All right, so um, this, uh, this is a, basically a story of God appearing to Abraham. It's a story of not just God appearing, but the Trinity, um, the Godhead. Um, and that's significant. We'll get into that more. But that's so, so very significant. And, um, <clears throat> and so we notice that... Um, the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, <clears throat> and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Well, if, it's, if it was a desert kind of place, I don't know about Mamre or Hebron, Hebron, but I know that living in a tent in the heat is pretty rough. So he, I guess he's getting some of the cool breeze or trying to. <clears throat> and um, uh, the Lord comes along. And uh, notice, though, that it says, And the Lord appeared to, to him in the plains of Mamre, which we, stu we study that a little bit in depth in chapter 13. Um, I'm sure you remember that. Um, we talked about the fact that Abraham's first actual possession in the land was Hebron, which means, <clears throat> which means fellowship. Fellowship. But it was more than that. 
we delved into it. We, we looked it up through Genesis. And what we found was that that was the main place where he lived his whole life. That was the main place where, you know, all of them, all the seed uh, lived for a while because some of them, there were some different scenarios. Um, and that's where they all were buried. Um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were all buried there. And I can't remember offhand, but I did search it out, and I just can't remember if Joseph was buried there. <clears throat> but, um, uh, and, you know, Jacob was, uh, his name change was to Israel, and they were living down in Egypt when he died. And they brought him back, and they brought him to Hebron to fellowship. They brought him to the place where they fellowship in, the, in death, to fellowship in the death of Christ, to fellowship in their death with Him. They're all buried there in that same, same place, no matter what distance. And, you know, location is an important thing. It just is. Now, I know, um, I know that this is talking about geography, and I think, I think that's true. I mean, I think that, you know, there's, um, you know, I, I, an example I used to use like my first year when I was saved because I had seen some revivals and some things happen in different places. And, and, um, and you know, it'd be like the Lord was moving over in the church over there. You know, he's moving over there. And so somebody's going, well, uh, you know, uh, you know, Lord, come down now or something. And I said, well, you know, if, if, there's a, if there's a waterfall right here and it's refreshing and it's giving you all this refreshing in the Lord, then what you need to do uh, is not ask him to open another waterfall on top of you. Just go over there and stand under that one. Be in the presence of God. And the point being the presence of God. But the Lord, you know, I mean... If you're hungry, if you if you're needy, if you're you know, be where you know you can get the Lord, where you can hear the Lord, where you can know that the Lord's heart is is being brought forth there, and go. But don't go. But don't put your trust in the place or the people of that place. Go there, but be have your trust in Him. I mean, uh, somebody in our church some, uh, many years back said, well, you know, um, I appreciate you, Randy, but I don't trust you. <laughs> and I laughed and said, I don't trust me either. I don't trust me. <clears throat> My trust had better be in the Lord or I'm in trouble, you know. That whole thing, we all need to have that relationship in such a way that we don't trust ourselves. Uh, I, I was looking at it or something recently, and, um, and it was uh, talking about uh, pride and talking about uh, not being humble. And, and the whole point of it was that we, um, we have pride uh, and we have all of that because we trust in ourselves. We get uppity when somebody, you know, uh, questions our veracity, you know, and uh, because we trust in ourselves. We think that we possess godly things instead of God possesses us and the godly things we have are God. It's Him doing it. He gets the glory. He's the one that we love. He's the one that we, we uh, give all glory to Him. And <clears throat> so, 
you know, what I started getting into this was talking about location, but there is this, there is this truth of our, our status within ourself. Our status usually within ourself is higher than the status that we give many people around us because we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And that was a warning by Paul, you know. Uh, I mean, I had a situation today that, you know, I just, you know, I guess you could just flat out say, well, I failed. I failed the Lord. I failed the Lord in a certain way. <clears throat> and, you know, it just grieves me to the bone. It grieves me because usually that ends up affecting somebody else when I, I do it, you know. Some of you, you can you can get away with it and it wouldn't affect anybody, but most of the time, somehow or another, when I mess up, it, it affects somebody. <clears throat> and and it usually affects, you know, the body of Christ somewhere, some person or some whatever. And and it just grieves me. And I, uh, as I was basically coming to tears over it uh, and just considering that before the Lord, um, I thought, within myself, I thought, <clears throat> if I had come to the Lamb by His nature, <clears throat> and I was with Him and walking in Him in this area, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have failed. I wouldn't have done that or whatever. And, uh, and I, you know, and my, the idea behind that was, you know, the answer is the nature of Christ, not just God correcting you. And so in my mind, that's what I was kind of holding to. You know, the answer is, you know, uh, growing in the nature of Christ, not God corrected me. Uh, which meant I lacked. And just as clearly, I heard God say, um, well, it also proves that I love you, because whom I love, I chase it. All right, so I start crying more, because <laughs> it's like, I, I mess up, and it breaks my heart, and I want to be in the image of Christ, but, you know, he had to correct me, and then he tells me, but I showed you my love for whom the Lord loves, He chastens. And so, for me, that can't be an excuse. I can't use that as, well, He loves me, so I can just do stuff wrong. I just want, I want Christ filling this vessel for His sake, and for the Father's sake. But anyway, so this, this, this place of location so much happens in the history of Abraham's life and the, the whole seed in this place of where everybody's put to death, where everybody's died and buried and uh, death is the huge theme of the place that Abraham is right now living with nobody in death but is there. He's claimed that place. He's claimed it. Uh, he even said when he bought it and everything, to bury my dead. But he's living there. <laughs> but he's living there. And um, <clears throat> so I wrote this, location is an important spiritual factor. We can be in tune with the Lord in certain areas, but be out of tune with Him as to the place that it is supposed to happen. Okay? It does matter. Location, it does matter. If, if it matters to him, then it matters. If it's just a piece of dirt, it may not matter. But he, he reveals where, not just when and how. <clears throat> um, remember from chapter 13 that Lot had chosen the best part of the land wherein to dwell. So I want to reread that because... Because this is where the dividing point came 
Yes, between Abram and Lot in Genesis 13. This is where the split came, if you will. This is also where Lot chose a certain location and Abram chose a certain location. Okay. So, and Abram said unto Lot, Abram said unto Lot, this is, uh, thir this is Genesis 13, 8 through 11. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herd herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren. Is not the whole land before you? This is Abraham, whom God promised the whole land. And he's saying, look, you know, take the, the whole lands before you. Uh, if thou wilt take, take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered. He lifted up his eyes and he beheld it, but he's noticing the benefits of the location, which makes it not necessarily the right place to be, the right location. Because it's not about how things benefit us. It's how they apply to death, burial, and resurrection in Christ. Um, <clears throat> and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. So number one, he sees it's well watered. It looks to him like the garden of the Lord. Hmm. Yeah, they, they still were passing down those stories of Adam and Eve and different people had come to different understandings of that. Lot had said, man, I want to get back to the garden. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, like the land of Egypt. This, it was even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor, then Lot chose him. Remember, we talked about that. He didn't just choose that thing. He chose him. He chose him. When he chose him, that fit him. Who he was. How he thought. What were his pre preferences. What were his prejudices. He chose him when he chose that land. He chose him all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. So that's the dividing point. And we'll read um, some more on that. But what it says, what it goes on to say of Abraham, that he, after Lot left, the Lord appeared unto him, and just started rehearsing again the things, the land, and all of this kind of stuff. And he went to, he ended up in Mamre, Hebron. Um, and that was the real place that he started to settle right after this story. So, um, so Lot, he was trying to get that which was best. So that's not, that's not really much different from... Saul, when he, t he was told to destroy Amalek, destroy the Amalekites, destroy Agag. Um, no, this is, he, you know, uh, Saul chose him. He did. He chose him. See, I mean, if we really understood stood that principle, we would be careful with our choices because we wouldn't just think of them as choices. We would be examining them as, as to, am I choosing me in this situation? Am I making me the actual object of what my decision is here? And is it me 
to make me comfortable or to make me happy or to make me this or that. Whereas Abraham's going, Abram's going, look, the whole land's before you pick whatever you want. He didn't even pick Hebron at first. God took him there. And there he decided. So, um, remember also that when Lot chose the best location that suited him, yet Abraham chose the place of death where all of them would be buried. It was Hebron, Hebron, which meant fellowship. God had moved on the part of the strangers in the land to begin the process of giving him the land. God moved on this king that owned the land and worked it out. Um, but he, he was there, but he's waiting on the full manifestation in chapter 18. Where is he sitting? He's sitting on a chair or whatever, right outside the tent in that same place, waiting for the fellowship of God's reality there. Maybe at this point he didn't understand the fellowship of God's reality, but he, you know, I think it was, I don't know if he named that, but that's the name of it. And so, um, uh, Abram, Abraham was abiding in the word of promise, waiting till the full manifestation came. But contrary to that, Lot lived in the comfort of a city while Abraham sat in his tent door. It was there God met with him. All right, so you remember, and we haven't got to that part yet, but I'm sure you're familiar with the rest of Genesis having to do with Abraham. Um, God goes up, in fact, I mean, this is, this is part of the journey. This is funny because it's part of the journey of the Trinity, that what they're making right now. They're passing through fellowship with Abraham on their way to check out what the real story is going on down there with Lot in, the, in that city. Okay, so it's a, this is a journey for God. They come down, all three of them, and they're, they're visiting within the land, if you will, that which they want to know their hearts. Okay. So, um, let me read to you uh, Hebrews 11. You, I know you're familiar with this. Uh, it's Hebrews 11, 9 and 10. <clears throat> By faith, he, Abraham, journeyed or sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents. And that word is used in, the word tense is the word that is used there in uh, chapter 18 here. Who, who dwelling in tabernacles or tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Okay, so, so he's, not, he's not dwelling with Isaac and Jacob yet. Uh, Isaac hadn't been born, neither is Jacob. But he is. Because this is their place. This is their meeting place. This is their living place. This is the place of the seed. And Abraham started the ball mo moving. The faith of Abraham. The faith. The faith of Abraham. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All right. So, uh, heirs with him of the same promise that verse 10 is the one I figured you're so familiar with for he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God this is what it says in Hebrews of Abraham we don't, we don't really get that in um, in the book of Genesis in the account that's talking about it we don't, we don't have anything that says he's Walking around looking for a city. But, but the book of Hebrews says that he looked for a city whose builder 
and maker is God. So I just began to, to meditate on that, and, and I began to think, okay, well, there is that fact that Lot went down to a city that wasn't built by God, and Abraham, even though he's sitting outside his tent, he's looking for a city that God will build, that, that he hadn't built yet, but God will build. He knew something. I mean, the, the way that it's saying that is he knew something. So, now you're familiar with this scripture. This is Revelation 21. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, <clears throat> And talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. The, the, I'm not going to show you the Lamb. I'm going to show you the Lamb's wife. And I'm going to show you the, I'm going to show you the true version of Sarah. The one who's going to bring forth all of the line. I, but I want to show, but I'm going to show you the reality, not the shadow of this. In verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great <clears throat> and high mountain and showed me that great city. Showed me that great city. Oh my God. Genesis all the way down to Revelation, we, we hear of the thing uh, from Hebrews relating to what's going on in Genesis. And the word Genesis means beginnings. And the book of Revelation, <clears throat> there it's all revealed. There it's all revealed. And so he takes him and shows me that great city. There's a great city. That great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. This is, this is the wife of the Lamb. He's saying, I will show you the wife of the Lamb, and he shows him a city. And Abraham is looking for it. Abraham has been clued in. Okay? Um, showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. <clears throat> and so now, when we read city, when we read city, we must be brought in to what that means to God. And from his viewpoint. And it is that which is. Now we know a city is many people. Just like the bride is really many. But it's only one uh, bride. He, he doesn't have. It's not all of us are going to be the wife of the lamb. We're, we're all going to be one as the wife of the lamb. Not a bunch of wives. And um, so it is. That, it is a city being many, it is a bride being many, but yet one spirit, one heart, one view. Clarity, clarity. A city with clarity. Um, verse 23 says, so when I say city, think wife of the lamb, think clarity, think all of this. And the city had no need of the sun. The, the wife of the lamb had no need of the sun. Neither of the moon. Mm -mm. To shine in it. The need it has clarity. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the lamb is the light thereof. Oh my Lord. The Lamb, and the, the, the Lamb is the light of this bride, this wife, particularly this wife 
there is uh, this is this is what Abraham's looking for. Abraham's not just looking for one guy, and that's my son, and that's my that's what I want. He's looking for a seed, a seed that will be after the lamb as a wife would in the spirit of, of that same heart and that wanting that same image and that same light shining, conforming them to that one image, which is the lamb. And um, Abraham is thinking in terms of, I want this to go. I mean, God, you showed me the stars. And then you showed me your heart, and I saw, and I believed. Here, they don't need the sun. They don't need all this. They just need the lamb, and their focus is one. They have clarity. They're not, they're not jumping around on subjects. They're not um, theologians. They're not scholars that can say everything so perfectly. Um, you know, I've said this before and, you know, got in trouble with some people, <clears throat> but um, there are greater things than being Christ-centered. There are a lot of people that feel so confident because they are Christ-centered. And they go, well, nobody in the most of the churches aren't, you know, and they start naming off denominations and all this stuff. They're not Christ-centered and this and that. And, you know, but we're Christ-centered. Folks, there's more than being Christ-centered. We are meant to be the wife of the Lamb. We are meant to be partakers of the divine nature. We are meant to show forth the glories of Him with whom we have to do. We are meant to show that not by Christian works, not by Christian ministries, not by my ministry is Christ-centered. Well, shame on you. Your ministry needs to be swallowed up of Christ. Swallowed up of Christ. So this is the city. This is the city. This is the one. And I don't know. Let me see. All right. We're going to go ahead and, and do some in verse 2. Um, just because we've still got a little bit of time. Okay. Verse 2. And he lifted up his eyes and looked. <clears throat> now remember... We read in Genesis 13 when Abraham said, well, look, just take whatever part of the land you want. The Bible says he lifted up his eyes and looked, but he didn't see the Lord coming like Abraham did. He saw something that drew him in Sodom and Gomorrah. He li but Abraham, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Okay, yeah, I am a little confused with you. Uh, he, it says, uh, uh, and lo, three men stood by him, and then when he saw him, he ran to meet him. Might have been a little short run. I don't know since he was standing right beside him. But the, it makes me believe uh, because there's a lot, here's why I'll say this. There's a lot of running going on in these verses. Abraham's doing it. He is running back and forth. He's running over there and then he runs back to God. He's running over here and he runs back to God. And so I got a feeling that um, uh, that they were far off. And as it will say, uh, he, uh, let's say, when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Beautiful. Beautiful. This is, this is 
the Father. This is His Son. This is the Holy Spirit that brooded over the deep and, you know, started bringing forth in creation. And they came for a visit. came for a visit. So I'm just going to read this because I really don't want to keep you super long here. <clears throat> this section relates to a visit from God in three persons. <laughs> a visit from God in three persons. Oh my Lord. On a certain day, Abraham looked up and noticed three men were coming down the road. Because of his ongoing close relationship with God, he immediately recognized them as the Trinity. He, saw, he said they're God. He said that's a Elohim. <laughs> he knew. He knew Elohim. We're not ready to get into that tonight, but he knew God. He, he didn't go, hey, there's three guys coming. He knew God and was in tune and in fellowship enough that as soon as he saw him, he rose up and ran to him. The first thing he did was to run to them, not away. <laughs> did you know there are people that run away from God regularly? There are. Oh, wait. Some of us could be that. Oh, no. Yeah. They're just, you know, not every time. Or maybe every time. But not every time. Um, but, oh, this, I don't know about this. You know. <laughs> you know, I've had that with, with uh, when I would be, like, meet with different people one at a time or something. And uh, uh, dread would come on them, like I was going to bring down the hammer. Do I bring down the hammer? I'm a pretty sweet guy. <laughs> Okay, maybe I do. But, you know, it's like, ah, I dread this meeting and everything. And, um, you know, many times it turns out that it's just the Lord blessing them and moving on their behalf. Um, once he got closer, Abra Abraham bowed down. That's in contrast a lot when this trip starts after, after God and Abraham finish their thing. God starts moving on down towards Sodom and Gomorrah. When God comes to the door of the house, not the tent, the door of the house of Lot, while Abraham's living back there in the tent, um, he doesn't bow down. He doesn't fall on his face. Once he got closer, Abraham bowed down. That is in contrast to Lot. When God came to Sodom, Lot did not fall on his face. One of the men, Abraham, was in a tenor of humility and oneness and, and openness. And the other, Lot, was as one who was more about his own life in this world. After his departure from Abraham, this chapter would include the first and only time God visited Lot. Lord, help us. You can be right there next to those people that really are after the Lord and want the Lord and still be Lot in your heart. Still after, you know, you know people, can, people can go after the message of Christ, which is not meant to be a message, but His life within us. But they can go after the message of Christ, learn the terminology and everything, because it sounds so spiritual, and they get to be spiritual, and they get to be something, and, you know, um, and all of that. And they have visions of how great their ministry is going to be, and therefore how great they're going to be. I mean, most of y'all know me, know that before I, you know, was even around the message of Christ, man, I was like that. Good grief. The vision of what, how great my ministry would be and me and all this stuff. Not realizing that, that the, the highest, you know, Abraham fell at Jesus' feet. The highest place on earth 
is at the feet of Jesus. You can't get any higher. It's the right place. It's the right place. And to, um, uh, you know, to try to gather in and this and that and to do it, you know, with, with something else working, you know, a whole nother mindset and a whole nother spirit. Well, that's a lot. That's, that's lot. And um, his herdsmen are, are given Abraham's herdsmen problems. And Abraham says, look, just take what you want. And Lot, Lot's going, uh, well, yeah. Look how it turned out. I mean, there's several, several bad things. Several times. <laughs> um, okay, so next time we gather together, and it's not going to be long, we'll be able to get to some really blessed parts here. Um, we'll get into verse 3. So, remember, continue to remember to pray for Tony and Celia and their family. There are others down there, Bibi and, and well, Jessica, and... Uh, that need our prayers and our love. Uh, if, if the Lord puts it on your heart, maybe bring some food for Cassie and the kids while Ben's away. Um, uh, remember to pray for Mike Gentry and, um, you know, just hold all these people close. You know, we're in a, we're in a lockdown, but we can hold them closer than we would have if we just went to a building and hug them a few times or once. That's, that could be more of a greeting. Hold them close is what I'm saying. Hold one another close. Hold each other together in the Lord. Father, we just thank you so much for all the things that you bring to us in your word and in your heart. Lord, so much, so much teaching. That's all. It, it could actually just be just so much teaching. Father, with all my heart, I pray that it reaches all of our hearts, not as teaching, but as spirit and life. Father, I have no desire just to be a teacher. I don't have the desire. My heart is that we all, till we all come to the measure, the stature, the fullness that is Christ. And Father, that measure and that stature that is the fullness of Christ is a lamb. It is one not seeking high places, but seeking to get lower. Father, thank you that you are at work in us. You are at work in us. You will never give up on your son. Even if we do, you still won't give up. So we love you and we appreciate, but appreciate isn't the correct word for your passion for Jesus and your willingness to send the Holy Spirit down here in this ugly world to bring forth beauty and to bring forth all the things that make the Lamb Lord of all. And every knee should bow. So thank you for that which works in you. We are partakers. We are, we, we, get to have the benefit of that. But we don't just do it lustfully, we do it thankfully. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen.